I want to impart to you today it is that Saudi Arabia is not at all a static society. It's a very dynamic place in which half the population is your age, okay? And growing up with uh, satellite dishes and internet access, very, very different from the environment. Yeah, that's what I Does that mean like they have grandparents that they used to be like herders and stuff? Yeah, absolutely. They live in tents, yeah, but they live with the internet and stuff. Yeah, they're, 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 this is, you have to understand that Saudi Arabia has done essentially 50 years, what took us 150. Okay, because they got rich overnight. And instead of having to invent the electric iron, Right? They imported entire dry cleaning stores. You know, I mean, they just, they didn't have to build it from the ground up. They didn't go from a uh, log cabin to bigger log cabin to a single story house, right? They, they went from nothing to mansions. And, and I might say that we, I think, many of us in America tend to assume that as people get better educated and better acquainted with the world, they become less religious. That's not necessarily a valid assumption in a place like Saudi Arabia, because the physical transformation has been so dramatic and spectacular, and the pattern, the, the centuries-old patterns of life in which you live in a small community watched over by your grandmother and the village imam have been blown away by urbanization and progress in this development of the cities. And so what's happened is that people have in many ways re-embraced the traditions of Islam because that's the glue that holds a society together in face of, the, in face of these otherwise devastating centrifugal forces. Um, so to understand now that uh, Saudi Arabia is what I call a grown-up country. It's not preserved in some religious amber. Aside from the, from the clothing, if you went there, what you would see is people taking their kids to school and getting stuck in traffic and going to the market and shopping at McDonald's and uh, grumbling about security procedures at the airport. Just like people everywhere. That's what they do. <clears throat> and so the, the, the task of running the country is partly that of administering the money and controlling the development and bringing about the modernization of the society, but it's also about maintaining social cohesion in the face of this immense transformation. Years ago, I have a, I have a good friend, a really distinguished gentleman, who has an important job in the oil ministry, big corner office. And he did me the honor some years ago of taking me to the village where he spent his boyhood. And if it was a road going out in the middle of nowhere. And on this side of the road is literally a small community of mud huts and a little oasis. Even the mosque is a little mud building. That's the community in which he spent his boyhood years. And on the other side of the road is this kind of Saudi Arabian Levittown, um, a, a, a suburban style community of identical little modern houses with uh, flush toilets and washing machines in them. And one day, the people of the Bud Hut village got up and they took their children and their animals and they walked across the road and across about seven centuries into their new homes. Because they had to learn how to use. Right? Their mothers didn't teach them how to flush a toilet because they never had them. They had to learn all this. And it was extremely disruptive <coughs> of the patterns of life that these communities had clung to for centuries. The whole country, in effect, did this virtually overnight. And so the forces of social cohesion, the monarchy, and the faith become more valuable rather than less in the face of these disruptive forces brought about by economic and material change. 